Hi, everyone, and welcome to our December market update. Tis the season to be jolly, and I hope you're getting to celebrate and share some special moments with loved ones. I'm Valerie Leonard, founder of Everthrive Financial Group, and we are going to talk today about how we can tame the economic Grinch and still keep the season merry and bright as we talk about investing for 2023 and beyond. Of course, after all the good news this year, we'd love to tell you that inflation will disappear, that interest rates will normalize, and that growth will skyrocket in 2023. But that's unfortunately not our reality. And we will be facing the same economic Grinch, meaning a global recession, in the new year. And over the course of investing in my life and, and, and even over my professional career, this is the fourth major economic downturn that I have lived through. And markets and economies have always moved in cycles. And thankfully, cycles don't last forever. However, certain investment categories and sectors historically tend to do better than others, depending on which part of the cycle you're in. And today we're going to take a look at what you need to know about the current cycle we're in now and how we as investors might consider positioning going into 2023. At this point, if you follow our updates each month, or if you speak to me in our regular client review meetings, you might think that I'm beginning to sound a little bit like a broken record. The Fed and interest rates are still two of the biggest factors affecting the economy right now. The situations in Ukraine and China are still impacting the global uh, supply chain and markets, and recession conditions continue, especially when you're looking at corporate profits. Here in the United States, the housing market slowdown is still very much underway. So these are all things that we continue to watch closely. Last month, we took a look at recessionary periods over the last 50 years, and we saw how periods of prosperity always followed recessions. And those prosperous times lasted much longer than any recession actually did. So let's take a look at markets going back even further today to 1926 in this case. This chart shows how a hypothetical investment of $10,000 in the S&P 500 in 1926 would have grown to more than $74 million by June 30th of this year. Now, most people realistically don't have a 90-year time horizon because we need to take our money out of our accounts for things like retirement and college and um, things of that nature. But this chart does capture the ups and downs along the way, and it illustrates how markets move in cycles. An upward sloping market trend like this one may make investing look easy, but the reality is that investors would have to be required to have lots of patience over this time period in order to avoid making investment mistakes. So for instance, the average bull market, which can be defined by a period of gains, it actually lasted 6.7 years on average with the average increase for investors being 362%. That's a lot of gains. But on the flip side, the average decline during bear market periods equated to a 37% loss and lasted 1.2 years. So for many investors, managing emotions for a little over a year can feel like an eternity. As a side note here, the average bear market occurred every 7.1 years. So bear markets are inevitable over your investment lifetime. I know that 100 years is a long stretch of time, so let's look at markets in just the last 12 years. This is a chart of the S&P 500 from 2011 to today. And of course, we were rebuilding after the 2008 crash um, when we start this chart in 2011. But even still, you can see how steady and reliable the growth has been in this 12-year time frame, even with the blip from the pandemic. The point here is that markets are designed to fluctuate. And they're going to have peaks. They're going to have valleys. And I know it's easy to get nervous in the valleys. But look at how much higher the S&P 500 is now, even compared to five years ago, despite all the turmoil that we've seen in the last few years. Still, markets are not the only part of the economy. And it can be hard to wait patiently for conditions to improve when you're feeling the pinch from your wallet from inflation like we are right now. So speaking of this, the last Federal Reserve meeting of the year takes place this week, and we do expect to see the Fed increase rates by a half a percent. 
I suspect we'll get a half a percent increase in January and again in February before the Fed starts to slow their rate hikes by about a quarter of a percent um, in March and beyond. And if you recall, the last four increases that the Fed um, announced were, were where we saw rates increase by three quarters of a percent, just to give you a little bit of perspective and how things are changing. We do expect inflation to fall to around four and a half percent by third quarter of next year. And the federal funds rate, which is the rate at which the Fed loans money to financial institutions, we expect that rate to stay around 5% in 2023 to continue to help fight inflation. One note to keep an eye on here, though, is that there is no such thing as a 30-year mortgage outside of the United States. And most mortgages across the globe will need to be refinanced in the next one to five years, with three years being the most common point they'll need to be refinanced. So if you consider the fact that other central banks throughout the world are raising interest rates as well, that means that consumers who own homes across the globe are gonna face higher housing costs and will have fewer dollars in their pockets to spend. So this is gonna be something we're also gonna keep an eye on. Now let's take a look at some good signs coming out of the recent data. The total value of goods and services that were purchased or produced here in the United States, we call this GDP, that grew last quarter really only at a slow pace, but it was an uptick from the shrinkage earlier this year. So we're going to be watching GDP closely because we expect economic activity to continue to slow. But for now, GDP is positive. Unemployment remains low, and this is a good sign, but I want you to keep in mind that unemployment typically is going to be one of the last indicators to potentially signal a recession since companies don't lay off until after the pain starts. And then finally, consumer spending remains high at this point, which means people aren't afraid to purchase goods and services. In fact, consumers keep spending despite inflation. So here in the United States, people spent a record $9.2 billion on Black Friday. And consumer spending beat expectations in September and again in October too. So the patterns of spending here also show good signs with people buying plane tickets at pre-packed pandemic levels. They're going to concerts, they're going back to the movies, they're dining out, and they're spending more money on services in general. But there's a caveat here, though. While we just talked about some good signs, what's good for the economy is not always good for the markets and vice versa. So there's two sides to every coin. Low unemployment and high consumer spending make it harder to fight inflation. And when inflation stays high, not only do you notice it in your budget, but the Fed increases interest rates, which slows growth, and we stay in the cycle. So while there are good signs for the long term, they can be uncomfortable in the short term. And this is why a lot of times when you turn on the TV, the news seems so conflicting, and why you may personally feel the pain of higher prices and lower market returns even when the economy overall has a good foundation. So we're seeing consumers open more credit card accounts than before. That's something we're watching closely as well. That means that they're relying on debt to finance all this consumer spending we're talking about. And this is the case while at the same time, their balances in their checking accounts and savings accounts and even retirement accounts are falling because of rising interest rates and because of higher inflation and uh, volatile market conditions. Now, normally we would end with a note on what we're watching, but in the spirit of taming the Grinch this month, we're going to end with what not to worry about. So first of all, let's talk midterm election results. While there were some surprises in terms of candidates, this led to minimal impacts overall on the markets. And we also have a divided government with a Democratic controlled Senate and a Republican controlled House. And this signals more fiscal restraint ahead potentially because neither party is going to be likely to be able to push their platforms through without some sort of, of compromise, making it unlikely that there are going to be any major market shocks other than just the normal expected ups and downs. So while we know it's natural to worry and we do have some bumps to get through, remember the market charts that I showed you earlier, okay, and the long-term historical trends. Finally, there's no need to worry about solving everything yourself. We are always here for your questions and your concerns. We're always looking out for our clients. We're here to help you navigate your retirement accounts, and we're happy to discuss any life events or changes that you may be experiencing. 
As a reminder, we are on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, we're on YouTube. So follow us and subscribe to these channels for market updates and news throughout the month. And as we wrap up 2022, we want to say thank you again for being with us throughout this year. This is a season of faith, of family, of friends, and it's a time to remember what really matters most. All of us at EverThrive wish you a very Merry Christmas and a wonderful start to 2023. Peace and blessings to you all. Take care, reach out with any questions or concerns, and we will see you again in the new year.